really wanted to have it in this space and have this discussion here. So thank you all for coming and, and being a part of this. Um, we are, we have three folks here with us tonight. The author, um, Mark Periscua, is a journalist for the Commercial Appeal, which is the daily newspaper in Memphis, Tennessee, where he's worked for the last 29 years. And if you know anything about journalism, that's like 800 years uh, in journalist years. Um, so he's a really amazing seasoned journalist. He's won numerous national awards for both feature writing and investigative reporting, a specialty honed over three decades working in a city long considered among the nation's most corrupt. He was the journalist who uncovered Ernest Withers' du double life. We also wanted to bring in the perspectives of activists um, who've been engaged in movement work um, from a historical perspective and a contemporary perspective. So Bobby Doctor is here with us tonight. He's the former director of the U.S. Civil Rights Commission Southeast Region in Atlanta. He was a field representative for the Rights Commission in Memphis in 1968 when the FBI investigated him with help from Ernest Withers um, as a black power sympathizer and tried to get him fired from his job. So he has a very unique um, perspective on the content of this book. And we also invited Mary Hooks, um, who is the co-director of Southerners on New Ground and a leading organizer with the Atlanta chapter of Black Lives Matter, to offer the contemporary perspective. Because as much as we might like to think that um, this is all in the, in the past, I think most of us realize that, in fact, there's still um, infiltration in movement work today. So um, we're going we're gonna to have that discussion um, and also talk about the role of cultural work. What does it mean that some of the most iconic and beautiful and moving um, cultural artifacts and photographs from the movement um, were taken by someone who also did harm? So we hope to have a robust discussion. We hope you'll ask lots of questions. But um, please welcome Mark, Bobby, and Mary. Thank you. Hello? Okay. It works. <laughs> all right. Thank you very much, everyone, for coming out tonight. I appreciate you all showing up. Um, I drove down today from Memphis in a rainstorm, so made it by the seat of my pants. Uh, <laughs> wasn't sure I was going to get here on time, but um, here I am. So I guess this is meant to happen. Um, I guess first I'd like to talk a little bit about Ernest Withers, and which who, he's the subject of my book, and um, <clears throat> the book just came out yesterday. It's part biography, part um, journalistic expose, telling you know how I uncovered this. It, it all happened as a newspaper investigation ten, uh, in 2010, is when we first came out with it. Um, let me tell you a little bit about Ernest Withers first. Um, Ernest was born and raised in Memphis. He ran a Beale Street studio down there, um, became well known. He was a, he was a policeman for a while, uh, walked beat on Beale Street. He knew everybody. Um, when he got into uh, freelance news photography, um, his career took off as the movement was blossoming, um, you know, with, with all these critical events, you know, the, the murder of Emmett Till, the, the, the Montgomery bus boycott, and on into Little Rock, the integration of Central High there, and Ole Miss, and, and Ernest covered all of that. I mean, he was an amazing photographer. If, if you, um, he's not a household name, but you probably recognize in the back of your mind a lot of his pictures, uh, like Dr. King riding that first integrated bus in Montgomery. It's a beautiful picture, very revolutionary picture. Um, there's a haunting picture that he took of, at Emmett Till's trial when um, the uh, Emmett's great uncle Moses Wright was on the witness stand, he stands up and he's pointing an accusing finger at the killers. They got away with it, but they were the killers. The judge had forbid any, any photography during session. Uh, Ernest de defied the order and took this picture for the ages. But he did that sort of thing on and on and on again. He had incredible 
access to the movement because of who he was. He was trusted and um, really is a, is a hero in Memphis and I think for the movement as a whole. Um, I don't, I'd like to say this is that I don't believe any of the things that I uncovered eclipsed the good that he did for the movement because, I mean, his images are powerful, they're timeless, and, you know, he deserves the credit that he, that he, that he gets. But it doesn't eclipse it, but it does rival it. There's this whole hidden history that, you know, we're even just now uncovering, you know, all, all of the, the, the micro history of what the government was doing to infiltrate the civil rights movement and the, the peace movement and related movements in that time. I mean, it really is an incredible hidden story. Um, how I uncovered that, I'd like to touch on that quickly, is way back in 1997, I've been at working at the Commercial Appeal, the daily newspaper in Memphis since 1989, 29 years, and you know, it is like 800 years sometimes it seems. But, um, but back in 1997, I was covering James Earl Ray's hearings. He was still alive then. He was trying to get out of prison. Uh, and he was dying of liver disease. And um, he, was, he and his lawyer were filing all manner of pleadings before the criminal court there, alleging various conspiracies. And um, uh, Dr. King's family endorsed a lot of these um, conspiracy accounts. And his younger son, Dexter, actually came up to Tennessee and met Ray in prison and shook his hand and said, you know, we believe you. We're going to do everything in our power to get you out. I mean, this was a huge story. And it was so surreal because, you know, here you had you know, Dr. King's son, who looked very much like his dad, you know, shaking the assassin's hand. And so there was a intense news coverage from all over, you know, nationally and internationally. And I had, my paper gave me a lot of latitude to, you know, dig around on stories that, you know, I probably never would have been able to do otherwise. And it was in that context that I met an FBI agent, a retired agent at that time, who I was trying to figure out, you know, what kind of surveillance they had on Dr. King in the days before he was shot up in Memphis. And, um, <clears throat> you know, one of the lingering critical questions was, did they have any electronic surveillance of him? And, <clears throat> you know, the FBI has always denied at that point whether they were doing that sort of surveillance. And, you know, my source said, no, you know, we, 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 we didn't need electronic uh, surveillance. We had that place covered with informants. Um, and you're going to hear more about that, too, because I, I think Bobby has an interesting story to tell about that, about another individual. But, um, and and this was in this context that he mentioned Ernest Withers. Um, and, of course, at that time, I'd been at the newspaper for about eight years. You know, I, I had relocated to Memphis from, I'm originally from Wisconsin. But I knew, you know, full well who Ernest was. You know, he was... He was big stuff, you know, and very much identified with the movement. I mean, he's been called like the eyes of the movement. And it was a very startling revelation, you know, that he told me that. But he told me that confidentially. He did not want to go on the record. He said that if I ever wrote about it, he'd deny it. So um, James, Earl, James Earl Ray died. The story died with him. The interest died. And like reporters do all the time, you just, you know, move on to the next thing, which, which I did. I spent, you know, years investigating public corruption in Memphis. Um, but it wasn't until after Ernest died that, you know, I started thinking about this again, and I, I filed a Freedom of Information Act request. Um, as, uh, as is done for historically significant people all over the country, you know, when some famous actor or politician dies or somebody out there, a journalist or a historian, filing a Freedom of, Freedom of Information Act request. I did that. I eventually got some paperwork back. He'd been under investigation after the civil rights era waned. He got caught up in some, some corruption, so there was an FBI file on that. And in that file is where there was a background report that referred to him, his previous work. And what it said was, Ernest Columbus Withers was formally designated ME338R which I knew just enough at that point to recognize that as a, as a code number. I mean, that's in the, in the FBI jargon, that's a, what they call a source symbol number. It's a unique identifier assigned to an informant. It, it's him and only him. And so I eventually got other reports and uh, found they'd made the same mistake. They were supposed to redact that, that sensitive information. And I was able to like piece together kind of like what he did over a, you know, a short window of time, 1968 to 1970 at that point, wrote some initial stories, then eventually um, <clears throat> located the daughter of the FBI agent who had 
handled Withers, and the agent was dead by then, but um, she had like found in his among his personal effects n numbers of you know papers like handwritten notes and things that he wrote about Ernest and by you know by name and by code number, and so that that led to more stories, and then uh, eventually we. Um, we wanted to get his informant file to figure out, you know, what was he doing, and we, we sued the FBI, and they denied he'd ever worked for them. He, uh, you know, they have a law that they relied on that allows them to essentially lie, and that's what they did. I mean, they, the law says that they, they don't have to identify. The, the law says informant records are exempt from the Freedom of Information Act, and they can treat them as if they don't even exist, and they took that legal position and fought us, and we spent hundreds of thousands of dollars. I mean, this is a paper that when I started there was had a lot of money, and now <laughs> there's hardly anybody even working there now. So we're spending burning all this money while we're losing money, you know, writing news stories. But um, eventually, you know, the, the confluence of factors worked for us. We had a sympathetic judge and, um, you know, in a convincing case, and the FBI had to admit in court that he was an informant. And that led to a mediated settlement where they paid back most of our attorney fees and uh, over the course of several years released a, you know, a whole mother load of records of things that he had done for the FBI. Um, and I'd just like to talk about that briefly. Um, it's really the foundation of my book, a lot of it, you know, as far as what he was doing for the FBI. Um, Basically, he worked for the FBI as an informant, a paid informant, from about 1958 to 1976. We don't know in those early years what he was really doing from 58 to 61. The records are sketchy. But starting in 1961, as unrest in this country started to unfold and the movement started to blossom, um, there was things going on in Memphis that the FBI wanted to keep watch on, and they needed someone like Ernest to do that. Some of the things that were happening were um, there was something called the Tent City Operation, which is in the Memphis metro area in Fayette County. It's, it was a rural county. Um, it was very much a, a, like a Jim Crow county. It, it really was more like Mississippi than West Tennessee. Tennessee is always considered more progressive than Mississippi, but, but when you get out in like Fayette County, it's so much like Mississippi. that. And what happened was there were all these sharecroppers who tried to register to vote. 19, around 1960, and the landowners kicked them off the land, and they basically set up refugee camps, you know, these tent city operations. And there were all these um, relief agencies, civil rights uh, organizations that were coming down from, from the north to try to assist the sharecroppers. Uh, the Congress on Racial Equality was one. Um, and there were a number of college students coming down, and the FBI viewed these individuals very dimly. Um, you know, they had waged a big war on the Communist Party in the McCarthy era just, you know, the decade before and running right into that period. The, the people who were coming down were viewed as agitators, subversives, communists. They, were, they, they would investigate these individuals to see what kind of, what they called subver subversive references they had. And, and th but they needed somebody on the ground. And the thing was is that, you know, Ernest having been, you know, being a photographer, Knowing everybody, you know, in the Memphis area through being a newsman and a policeman, he, he, he was immense help to them because he could go out, you know, they, they, basically what they were doing is they were, they were cataloging the movement. They wanted to know who was who, who was connected to who, you know, who their associates were, where they worked. I mean, a lot of this stuff was so intrusive, gathering all these personal and political data on individuals, but it always starts, you know, with, a, with an identification photo. So. He could go out, they'd send him out, you know, many times or other times he'd go out just in the course of being a newsman, get pictures, get information on individuals, who they were, what organizations they were with, on and on. So you had the tent city operations going on in 1961. You had Freedom Riders coming back from Mississippi and, you know, there were several from, from uh, Memphis who uh, were Freedom Riders. And, you know, the Freedom Riders, it was kind of like a turning point in the, in the movement in that, you know, the, the direct action, the, you know, the, the you know, marching, the sit-ins, and that sort of thing was really starting to blossom. And for a lot of the more conservative people in the movement, like in Memphis, the NAACP, they weren't really into that sort of thing. I mean, their thing was really, you know, you, 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 you get your rights in, in court, you litigate. And so a lot of these guys who were coming back were viewed as, you know, militant uh, 
you know, agitators. And so the FBI wanted to know where they were. And Ernest would, you know, pass on, you know, this guy's staying at the YMCA. This guy was meeting with so-and-so. And then, you know, another thing that was going on at that time, the Nation of Islam was just starting to, to appear in some of these rural areas in, you know, what we call the Mid-South area around Memphis. And they opened a, a mosque on Beale Street. Um, again, you know, Ernest knew all these guys. You know, he, he, a lot of them came down to his photo studio. And so, you know, he could give them, you know, tell them who, you know, who they were related to, their grandparents, you know, where they lived, what jobs they had, and on and on and on. So that's how this whole thing got started with him. Um, and, you know, people often ask, why did he do it? Um, I think he had multiple motives. You know, one was he had eight kids to feed. He, he was always in need of money. And so, you know, here is extra income. He was always trying to hustle for a living and feed his family. Um, you know, he was older, too. I think he had uh, some political motivations in that he was more conservative. He was a World War II veteran, fought in the war, you know, especially when, when, when the, the whole peace movement broke out. And he helped the FBI with that, too. They would send him out to catalog these marches, get good face shots, identification pictures. Um, uh, you know, he, he was, uh, you know, very much invested in the military. So, you know, he had, you know, his own, his own military record, but he had three sons who were in the military, and one was in the front lines in Vietnam. So, um, that factored into it as well, and, and another thing was his, um, his longtime desire to be a policeman. You know, he was one of the first African-American police officers, um, briefly, from 1948 to 1951. It, uh, it didn't work out for him, but um, he later became a, a state liquor agent. But he always had this, you know, this long-time interest to be a police officer. And really what, what the FBI was doing, they were policing the movement. And this went on. He helped him with so many different things, you know, from, you know, the Tent City operations, the Nation of Islam, Freedom Riders, um, Dr. King's Southern Christian Leadership Conference, when they came up there, you know, he was informing on them. He got in on the board of directors from when they op opened an SCLC chapter and you know, was giving them financial details and other personal things from the inside, the, the, uh, the whole black power movement, which really freaked them out. You know, the black power was, you know, the FBI was all white and they had no idea what was going on. I mean, they, 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 it was one of these things where they just really exaggerated the threat to, uh, to public safety. But um, this went on for, you know, well into the 70s. Um, and so I think this history is very instructive. Um, you know, I've said many times, I'm not trying to erode Ernest legacy. He's a very important historical figure. He did a lot of good for the movement. But, you know, to know, the FBI always talks about, like, sources and methods. These are the things they don't want you to know about. Who are their sources? These informants, they protect them zealously. And, and methods, how do they do this, you know? And so here they had a cooperative newsman, you know, who was a very affable guy. Everybody liked him, and he just happened to be, you know, the kind of guy who could get this kind of information. So, um, it worked out very well for them, and um, you know I think it's very instructive, you know, digging through this whole hidden history because, you know, there's always going to be this tension. You know that this these issues are relevant. They were relevant back then. They're relevant today. A hundred years from now, they're going to be relevant because you're always going to have somebody trying to preserve the status quo and you know law enforcement. Their you know their stated objective is. Uh, to preserve law and order, right? And so and then the other side, you've got people who are oppressed or fighting for their rights, and so they're going to be disruptive. And so they're, they're going to be bumping up against each other. So this is very, I think, an in instructive lesson to know and take heed of as we you know, move through these times and on through the future. And with that, I think I'm going to pass the baton um, to my friend Bobby Doctor, who, um, and I'm, I'm Bobby, I don't want to steal your thunder here, but uh, just, uh, I mean, as, as ER said, uh, you know, Bobby was a um, longtime leader, uh, director of the uh, U.S. Civil Rights Commission down here in Atlanta, but he also had, was a field rep in Memphis, and I don't want to tell his full story, but he's got a heck of a story about how the FBI tried to, to undercut him in Memphis back in 1968. Well, thank you, Mark. Um, let me begin by saying that I recently had open heart surgery. And while I was on that table, I also had a stroke. 
So forgive me if my memory is not as clear as it might have been a few years ago. But I think I can recall enough of what needs to be said about my friend, Ernie Withers. Ernie was an interesting character. I knew him on a personal basis. Interestingly enough, he befriended me when I got to Memphis. Uh, that was back in 65. We had just opened the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights' first regional office in Memphis, Tennessee. And interestingly enough, um, they wanted Vernon Jordan to head up that office. But there was a congressman in Memphis who, for whatever his reasons, didn't want, uh, in Atlanta rather, for whatever his reasons, didn't want Vernon to head up that office. So a guy named Jack Wilmore became the director of that office. Jack was a good guy. Back to Ernie. Ernie and I had a close relationship. But Ernie told some lies. And I'm not here to brush over and, you know, castigate Ernie. But the bottom line is Ernie told a bunch of lies on a bunch of people in Memphis, Tennessee, who tried like the devil in a racist city, in a racist city. The police department was the most racist department in the country. And I can say that without hesitation because we did a number of programs on police department relations with the black community. Memphis came out at the bottom, no exaggeration, at the very bottom. But Ernie, Ernie told some tremendous fears. He's still a friend, or he used to be a friend. But Ernie told a lot of lies. For example, Ernie told the FBI that I was sleeping with a certain woman in Memphis. Nothing was further from the truth. He told that lie on that woman, and she denied it, and I denied it. It didn't happen, and that's the God's honest truth. But Ernie told that lie. Ernie also told a bunch of lies on the militants in Memphis, Tennessee, Charles Cabbage and Kobe Smith, who I got together with upon arriving in Memphis. And um, what Ernie did, and I didn't find out about it until I had moved back, well, moved from Memphis to Atlanta to reopen our office down here, that Ernie had told these lies. I denied it. The woman denied it. It never happened. That's the truth. It never happened. So I'm not going to sit here and talk about the good things that Ernie did because he did a lot of bad things. You're right, Mark, about Ernie, um, about Ernie needing money. He did need money, no question about that, and he allowed himself to be used by the FBI and, of course, the Memphis Police Department. Ernie suggested that I give you all some background on what I've been about, what I've been into, and that may better explain why I'm sitting here jumping on Ernie now in, in his death. I Back in 1961, the day after the kids up in Greensboro initiated the student sit-in movement, the next day I got together with 12 of my fellow students at South Carolina State College, and we marched downtown. I'll never forget, we ran across a woman down there, elderly black woman, who made the comment, and she was talking to me because I was leading the group from the left side of the street. She said, why are you all bothering those folks? They ain't bothering y'all. We were trying to get downtown before the cops could mass to keep us from going in these stores down there. So we didn't have enough time to try and educate the woman. But I never forgot those comments she made. 
I would assume that she benefited from what we were trying to do. I know she benefited to some extent from what we were trying to do. But the sad comment about all of that, we were the second group of students in the country. Now, interestingly enough, you all have not heard the story because the press in Orangeburg, South Carolina, didn't exist. Not only did they not exist, but those who were there in the press hated our guts. We went on downtown. We went into the, I can't even remember the name of the five and 10 cent store now, but it's on the square, or it was on the square in Orangeburg. And we sat down and they decided that they would close down the store. So the store was closed. We went back and we initiated an even bigger, bigger movement. The sad thing about all of that is nobody ever heard about it. We were the second group of students in the country to initiate a student sit-in movement in this country. That is the absolute God's honest truth. I don't say that in a bragged audacious kind of way, but I say that to let you know some history about the students in South Carolina. At the start of my career, and that was the very beginning of my participation in civil rights, at the start of that movement, we traveled throughout the entire state of South Carolina. I remember getting into an argument with a young woman who claims the movement up in Greenville was the start of the civil rights movement in South Carolina. I said, well, that's your story, but mine is true. <laughs> we started the civil rights movement modern day in South Carolina. We travel all over that state. Jim Clyburn, you probably have heard of Jim. Jim is now um, a Democratic leader in the House of Representatives. Chuck McDo, who also was a spokesperson for our movement. Chuck was the third chair of SNCC. And there were others, including me, who became the acting director of the US Commission on Civil Rights. I'm very proud of that. But from Orangeburg, I went into the military. I didn't want to go to Vietnam. After coming out of the military, I decided to compete for a position with the Southern Regional Council right here in Atlanta and a group that was called um, NIRO, the National Organization for the, oh, I can't even think of the name now. But it was a group that was about the business of selecting young black leadership from all over the country. And I, interestingly enough, was selected as one of the 25 persons who were part of that group that year. And I ended up with the Virginia Council on Human Relations. I went up there and I worked for about a year and a half in Virginia. And then I ran into a guy named Samuel J. Simmons. You haven't heard much about Sam Simmons, but Sam was the field director, I mean, not the field director. Sam was the the, uh, the head of the Office of, of Regional Directors. And um, Sam and I met. And Sam hired me to become a field representative with the US Commission on Civil Rights down in Memphis. One of the things that Sam said to me was, Bobby, when you go down there, make some bullets. I knew what he was talking about. He certainly knew what he was talking about. And when I got to Memphis, I did just that. I met with Charles Cabbage and Kobe Smith. And uh, that was after, of course, I found out that there was not much of a militant movement in Memphis. I got together with Charles and, and, and Kobe, and we organized a group of young people who were nothing but a gang, to be honest with you. But we organized them into a civil rights organization. Now, there are a lot of people who had a lot of problems, including the FBI, with what I was doing down there. But I wasn't doing anything illegal. 
but they tried to pretend that I was doing a lot that was illegal. They even sent all kinds of letters to our staff director in, in Washington, D.C., suggesting that I should be terminated and all kinds of foolishness, including the foolishness that, that um, um, Ernest, Ernest was passing on to the FBI. And it's a sad commentary, because I kind of liked Ernie when I met him. He and I got along well. Every time we were together at a meeting, and I was at a lot of meetings, and he was there too, we would always find a way to get together and talk about the movement and talk about what was going on, what needed to go on, and all sorts of things like that. But I was surprised when I got the word that Ernie had told these lies about what I was doing in Memphis. That bothered me. It really bothered me because I was here in Atlanta. Ernie was still over in uh, Memphis. But I didn't get mad at Ernie. I didn't get mad at Ernie because Ernie was doing what he had an obligation to do to, for his family. He was helping his family survive. And the sad thing about that, Ernie died not long after I left. So I never got a chance to discuss with him what he had said about me in those FBI reports. But interestingly enough, I did get a copy of those reports. I have them at home in a folder like that. I will never forget them. They will always be in my memory, as will Ernie always be in my memory. Interestingly enough, There's a guy named Morel McCullough. You probably have never heard of Morel McCullough. But he was one of the informants that the FBI put into the group that Charles Cabbage and Kobe Smith and I organized in Memphis. It was, um, it was a, uh, you may recall the shot of Martin Luther King being shot. The first individual who got to his body was Morel McCullough. Now, Morel McCullough was an informant. I didn't find that out until after I had gotten down here in Atlanta. But Morel McCullough was a big time informant. He later, he at the time was working for the Memphis Police Department. He was working for the FBI. He was working for all sorts of agencies that were giving us help. And the sad thing about it, McCullough also went to work for the CIA all over the world. But McCullough was the first individual besides the body of Martin Luther King Jr. the minute he was shot. You see a guy kneeling down, kneeling down. That's Morel McCullough. Morel McCullough. I'd like to have a chat with Morel McCullough. I remember when he first came into the group, the militant group, and I, I thought something was kind of strange because he was, over at, he was over at Memphis State. And we generally didn't get Memphis State students to come to the militant movement. So I had certain suspicions, but they were never verified while I was in Memphis. But this one day I got this call from one of the brothers. He told me, you're not going to believe it. I said, what? He said, you remember Morel McCullough? I said, yeah, I do. He said he was a big time informant. Big time. Now, the whole time I worked with those young guys, I never saw them do anything, quote, illegal, end quote. But the FBI had a real problem with what I was doing. A real, real problem with what I was doing. Here in Atlanta, I became the regional director of the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights. Um, I don't know how many of you have heard of some of the things that we've done here in Georgia, but we've done a lot of things, not only in Georgia, but around the South as well. We initiated a series of informal hearings on police community relations. And interestingly enough, we found a lot of bad things going on in the police departments. They were shooting people and killing people and 
we'd get complaints, complaints. And while we didn't have the staff to handle all of those complaints, I made an effort to do what I could with what I had. And the sad thing about it, when we first started this project on police community relations, I was the subject of all sorts of criticism from my people in Washington. They wanted to know what we were doing. I said, well, we're doing what should have been done years ago. Should have been done years ago. Now we're getting back to police misconduct. And if it had been done the way it should have been done years ago, we wouldn't be having this problem today. Now with that, I'll stop, but certainly answer any questions you may have. All right, I'm gonna just take it away. Um, well, I appreciate one, thank you for Karis uh, and Auburn for uh, having you here and inviting us uh, to be a part of this panel. Um, uh, I think um, hearing these stories, uh, let me just back up a little bit. My name's Mary Hooks. <laughs> um, um, and I'm a part of the Black Lives Matter chapter here in Atlanta, as well as the co-director of Southerners on New Ground. I uh, joined movement uh, back in 2009 uh, when uh, I found movement in a bar. I should say movement found me in a bar. Um, and I was able to, uh, met a woman who said she was trying to stop the shackling of black women while giving birth in a prison. And it blew my mind. And I'm like, what? That is happening? And you're doing something about it? My word. And she introduced me to song. And I joined as a member. Um, and I would say a lot of what uh, you all just spoke about resonates, particularly over the last few years. Um, and some may, you know, mark August 9th, 2014, and the killing of Mark Brown. Some also mark um, the uh, non-indictment of uh, George Zimmerman um, for the murder of Trayvon Martin as, you know, those moments that begin spurring up what I like to call the, this iteration of the Black Liberation Movement. And I think um, as uh, someone who has been a part of, um, you know, actions and work here in Atlanta, but also with uh, the work inside of Song, moving across the South, doing work with um, our comrades in other uh, localities and states, and also being a part of uh, the Movement for Black Lives and that coalition of organizations. Um, I think uh, it's interesting the way in which we grapple with this question around um, um, provocateurs and informants, if you will, and you know, it's, I'm, I'm sitting here and, I'm, and in my mind I'm saying, Lord have mercy, how much should I be sharing tonight? What is helpful, what is useful? Um, and so I think what is important um, that we're grappling with in this current moment is one, how do we, uh, these methods, these methods that we know the state continues to use on our people. Well, a lot of them, you know, was written into um, the Patriot Act, right? So. Uh, a lot of the work that uh, they sent folks with boots on the ground to do, the technologies that we incorporate into our organizing, um, oftentimes is used as a tool to monitor, to surveil. We know that the police um, use specific um, software to track um, language and words that are being used online to help organize folk um, offline and into the streets oftentimes and into meetings that they're surveilling and, and we're seeing that. Um, and we also know that um, there are individuals who are also have made their way into movement. And, um, you know, Mama Ruby Sales, who uh, is one of my mentors, oftentimes, um, you know, one time set us down and talked to us and said, you know, you all have to be weary of uh, provocateurs. Um, and, you know, the fact that they come to not just kill, steal, and destroy, I the wrong <laughs> reference. Uh, yeah, I didn't get it. Okay, church folks, I thought it was funny. No, okay, whatever. But provocateurs coming to, um, to um, confuse our people and to lead our folk astray and to oftentimes uh, agitate when there is no need for agitation and to escalate when we have called uh, for de-escalation and all of these things. And we've seen it uh, here in Atlanta. We've seen it um, uh, across the region. Comrades from other parts of the country have talked about um, 
how individuals oftentimes fitting a very interesting prototype. And I don't know with some of the gentlemen that you all named um, if they fit a particular prototype, but oftentimes, um, you know, there's a prototype, uh, if you will, at least from my read, um, of the way in which, and, and I don't want to, um, but what I see, just name what I'm seeing, is traditionally young black men uh, in, this, in this moment being used as a tool. And so as I'm sitting here in my mind, I'm saying, Lord have mercy. Uh, one, I was curious about what are, are there women? Who are the women who have been identified as folks who have uh, played that role as informant? And what has been the motivation, right? And I know you all named like uh, the motivation for taking care of uh, folks' families and children. Um, but it's also something that we're seeing I think it's also in this particular iteration of movement when there is a strong presence of black, uh, black women and black queer women at the front lines and black trans folks at the front lines of this work, oftentimes the folks who we have some of the most um, rigorous encounters with are folks who are openly homophobic, openly transphobic, openly disrespectful to women and seeking position. And so I'm like, what is it about our movement that um, we have not successfully addressed patriarchy and the fragility of egos that allows our people to betray our people. And, and, I, and I would rather starve. Ernie, I don't know you. I'm so sorry. I don't mean to be disrespectful. Um, but what is it about us that we choose not to starve and betray our movement? And that breaks my heart. It breaks my heart. But I, we know it's a known thing, right? Because um, uh, we would be disillusioned if we were, it's not just about, um, I think it, you know, some ego and money and all of these things, but the state is, uh, is rigorous in, in their attempt to dismantle movement. You know, uh, we have to name that the state was convicted, right, convicted of um, being behind the assassination of Dr. King. And so, I, um, in these moments, I think what, what one of the things that we find is our weakness you know, has been one say, you know, we're in like the age of like digital technology. We have all these tools at our disposal. We can like send out a tweet, millions know, get to the street. And that is also being one of like the most, um, uh, one of the things I think that is uh, being one of our gaps in terms of how we are able to organize securely. Um, there's, uh, you know, in the level of surveillance that we see just in our, even in our neighborhoods, excessive cameras, excessive police, all the things. Real talk, city of Atlanta don't even have to move out of their office. They have, you know, they know where we march. They know where the, you know, they're like, oh, they probably gonna hit, you know, downtown, make a left on, you know. They know our movements and the, the, our city is so overly surveilled where literally everything is on camera. And they're like, well, watch us march. And then they're like, well, if they're not doing nothing, then we, you know, won't really have to go out there. We'll just watch them on TV. You know, and if it's worth us getting out of our beds, we will. And so um, I think, you know, um, in Atlanta, we've also experienced real talk. And I'm going to just be very frank because I have to be honest and, and tell the truth. Because I would hate for 15, 20, 30 years later, someone's like, oh, my God, we didn't know. Well, we know who is our opposition or at least who has chosen to betray the people, as Dr. Um, uh, Baba Shokwe Lumumba uh, once said, you know, if you don't uh, walk with the people, you'll betray the people, right? And so um, one of the things that I'm going to just, uh, when um, we put the call out to like, yo, let's organize the people around starting a Black Lives Matter chapter here in Atlanta. And uh, the comrade Dre, like, hunted me down like, Mary, we have to start this chapter, you know? And um, we called upon the comrades that we knew had some skills, had already been in organizing to bring about that first meeting that happened. You were there, Che, held it down, held it down. Um, and to bring about that first meeting, almost, two, almost 200 people came into that room that night. And immediately, um, one of the friends, the friends, I'm uh, being too gracious. One of the folks who uh, came into that space was a gentleman by the name of Sir Major. Raise your hand if you've heard of him. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, a gentleman by the name of Sir Major. And he comes into the room and immediately was, you know, he was excited about wanting to participate, hit me up afterwards, you know, came down and met with me, I want to participate, da 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 da, da. And, um, and then started showing signs of 
not really wanting to get along, was saying some things in the meeting, but you know, as um, we know that uh, addressing you know, our internal struggles with homophobia and transphobia, all the things, if we're gonna have an intersectional movement, it's not gonna come easy. We're gonna have to struggle for it. Our folks don't come into the room decolonized and all the way ready to, you know, cause we've been taught some things. And so we're like, all right, we'll, you know, work out with the brother, you know? And um, when he came into the movement, and join the chapter, um, uh, he began doing things that was disrespectful to other people's work. And many of these relationships, again, I started organizing in 2009, relationships that organizations had been, had built political trust. And um, he began doing things that was, we were, that was questioning. We were like, yo, is this a training issue? Or you are uh, intentionally taking folks' work taking their name off of it, putting our name on it, and then the folks, the other organization looking at us like, why well, are y'all taking our work, you know? Um, causing friction that we, you know, had to settle. And um, eventually things spiraled to the extent where uh, he has to be the director of communications. Or we were like, we don't even have a role director of communications, whatever. And we were like, no, um, given some of your patterns, you on the wrong seat on the bus. And, um, and he w was a livid live it and we talk to him about what it means to air the grievances you know let's be in principle struggle but don't you dare go online and talk about what we're talking about inside of our meeting because it undermines movement it gives the folks who is watching us you know bait and uh i couldn't even make it home and i lived seven minutes from where we was meeting somebody called me as mayor did you see what he posted online and um we struggled asking him to take it down all the things and eventually he uh wound up getting arrested at an action that um uh, another organization put together, um, Rise Up, uh, put on. And when he was arrested, he, um, afterwards he called me. And I remember he called me after he got out and he said, Mary, I'm so sorry. I want to publicly apologize for the things that I've written online and the things that I've said about you and others. Because you were right, the state will use um, our tensions um, to divide us. And I'm giving him talking points on what to say to to us, to meet us and everybody, he's um, offended. At the time we thought it was an offense or just lack of, um, lack of training. And uh, I would say maybe three, four weeks later is when he began starting this uh, Black Lives Matter Greater Atlanta chapter and began moving the narrative that, um, that the, the BLM chapter was moving a gay agenda and that uh, it hated men and that all of these things, to, and, and folks begin getting confused. Folks begin saying, yo, we donated money, we think, you know, and it ain't even about the money. But the, the problem is that um, the, how our folks have been led astray. In real talk, it has had deep impacts on um, the work that we've been able to move and not move here in Atlanta. And I think that one of the sad things is to say about it, even in this city where we have, you know, literally the website that this guy has put up, uh, the address is registered to the police department downtown. That, um, you know, after talking to other organizations, we're like, hey, y'all, you know, I, one of the questions that I have for you, sir, and you, I'm curious about when, um, when, when folks have shown signs of being a provocateur, what did folks do in movement uh, in your present day? What were folks doing? And what was that intervention looking like? Um, because, you know, even when we have People know who we are and people, you know, um, know who some of the activists are here in the city. Um, but when 2015, 2016, I think that was 2016 when Alton Sterling um, uh, was murdered and thousands of people took to the highway and took to the streets and then uh, they took to the governor's mansion led by ATL is ready and um, the mayor called for a cooling off period once black folks started showing up on the governor's lawn, called for a cooling off period. And then in walks the provocateur who goes on television and says, yes, Black Lives Matter says it's time for a cooling off period. You know, and so we're seeing uh, the manipulation of our movement by folk who choose, again, I don't know if it's their ego. I don't know if they want position and status. I don't know if folks don't believe us when we say we are a leader full movement, that there will be no Messiah leader coming about. Um, and folks want to occupy that space. I recall having a conversation with a, uh, a very established um, civil rights organization who was working with him. And I explained all of these things. And I said, so I don't understand um, why you all want to continue to work with them. And they, um, 
you know, was insistent that he could be the next MLK. They, this is what he said to me. He could be the next MLK. And M MLK believed in um, redemption. And MLK believed in um, nonviolence, um, nonviolent practice. And so I think there's also an issue of um, what it means and how elders that have trained us up have said you isolate, you isolate that person. And so there's also something there, I think, too, with, um, yeah, with how we deal with all of these things. I think that uh, give folk the, the heart to choose um, themselves over our people and the collective, choose the I over the collective we. So I'm going to stop there because I feel like I'm rambling. But um, yeah, would love any feedback. Well, it's interesting when you look back at Memphis in, in the period there that, you know, I researched with Ernest Withers, they set up a, a um, the FBI set up a, what they called a red squad. Um, these were p done all over the country. They were um, basically kind of like an FBI light is what I like to call them. But they had their, they, they, the two were working in tandem and they did have a lot of infiltration of the, particularly the, the militant movement toward the end of the 60s. And, and a certain type of individual that they would recruit. It's interesting that, you know, the FBI, of course, recruited Ernest Withers, and he had a military background, but, and Bobby, you may, might know some of these names, but, I mean, the police department brought in several young men to infiltrate an organization they called the Invaders, which was a homegrown pack, black power group that was kind of modeled, it was modeled after SNCC, um, and to some extent later, the Black Panthers out of Oakland, too. But, they were looking for certain individuals who had military backgrounds, and, and uh, Morel McCullough was one. He was a military policeman and j had just come out of the Army, and they put him up, uh, basically put him up as a student at Memphis State University, and then had him come over and infiltrate the invaders. And then meanwhile, there was um, a couple of other undercover policemen, um, a guy named Don Pigford. I don't know if you remember him, Bobby, or if you knew him when he was active. They, that was kind of surprising to people when, I mean, I don't know that that's really actually, it's kind of an open secret. I've seen his personnel file, and he was, he was an undercover cop, okay, but, but he was pretending to be an activist. And, um, and then also uh, uh, a man named Tyrant Moore, too. He, he had done a lot of that, too. I don't know if you knew him. But, you know, it's kind of interesting, the provocateur element, it really doesn't come out to a, to a large degree, but you kind of, when you read some of these reports, you get a sense that, like, I know there was some insinuation at some point that Don Pigford, who has passed away, was trying to rock, you know, get everyone working, we need to get weapons kind of thing, you know. So to what extent these operations were working in the provocateur type uh, function to undermine them is, um, I guess, debatable still, but I mean, there's probably a lot of research that needs to be done on that, but there was certainly that, that tension going on. And um, I don't know, Bobby, did you, did you get that sense with, yeah, I, most of my opposition came from the FBI and the, and the police department. I know we had to bust about it, they hated my guts. Um, I recall on one occasion being in the bathroom in the federal building, and I was rushing to get in the stall, and I saw these two guys in suits and ties, and they were washing their hands and went in big time. And as I entered the stall, um, two wet paper towels came over and landed on where they thought I was going to be. And I thought that was rather odd because I knew them as FBI agents. And um, those were the biggest provocateurs that, that I had trouble with. And the police department. Um, the most racist FBI agents. I, I would be down in Mississippi, watching something that was going on from a civil rights standpoint. And I would see FBI agents standing around while the police department were beating up the, 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 the black folk. I mean, just beating the hell out of them. And we'd get back to Memphis and tell the FBI agent in charge about what was going on, and he never did anything about it. So I knew it was a waste of time to go complain to somebody about the paper tires that with, soggy with, coming over the, over the fence, over the uh, door in my direction. Um, but there were a lot of things that were going on 
at that particular time. I mean, civil rights groups used to come from Memphis all the time. That's where I first got a chance to meet Dr. King and, and uh, Jose and, 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 and uh, I don't recall meeting Andy over there, but, but. He wants you to speak into him. Oh, I'm sorry, okay. Sorry about that. Um, but that was the first place I met Dr. King, in his room, interestingly enough. And you all remember James Meredith, who had started a march from Memphis to, to uh, Mississippi and was um, waylaid. He had a friend from New York who came down to take his place. And um, this kid was talking about marching that day. And Doc was trying to convince him to wait until he could round up all the other leaders. And he did convince this kid to wait. But that was the first time I had seen, I mean, I had met Martin King. And uh, to, to see those guys in action, to see them interacting with each other was, was, was something else. Um, it really was. It really was. Well, Mary, uh, to speak more to your point about you know modern um, infiltration in in Memphis, spinning out of this whole period, going into the late 70s, the ACLU actually sued the Memphis Police Department because it came out through somehow or another some cop you know I guess let it leak out that they were keeping all these secret files and everyone. The ACLU sued the Memphis Police Department in 1976 when they started getting word of this of, for this illegal political surveillance that they were doing. Mm -hmm. And um, the FBI immediately went, the mayor to, uh, ordered the, one, of the, one of the head uh, top brass over there to go burn, burn all the files. And they burned like, uh, I think it was 10 filing cabinets of files uh, <laughs> before, they could, before they could get to the, you know, the, the goods. And, but they did get a consent decree. It was a landmark decree. And some cities across the country have these that are still in effect today, and Memphis is, is where the police department is, it's forbidden for them to, to engage in any illegal political surveillance. They cannot collect data for, on, on people who are exercising First Amendment rights, you know, like the right to assemble, free speech, you know, the right to march, et cetera, these sorts of things. Uh, Interestingly enough, uh, there's several people who believe the police are violating this. Um, I did a story for the, my newspaper back in 2010 um, when I went through the, the police policy manual, I was looking for any reference to this consent decree and there was nothing in it at all. <laughs> I mean, there's nothing telling them, hey, you know, don't do any illegal political surveillance and, and I called over there and they were all kind of scratching their heads and they didn't know what I was talking about. And then, like a couple days later, suddenly they've got language in the manual, and they're you know that they shouldn't do it. But a lot of people think they're doing it anyway. And there was a suit filed um, last year when another story was leaked about how the uh, at City Hall <clears throat> they were keeping a blacklist of certain activists, including Black Lives Matter activists. Um, they were the um, the security was instructed that you know. If so and so shows up, he's going to need a, a police escort. You know, think about it. You're going to city hall, maybe you know, whatever, to meet with a councilman or to get a permit or whatever legitimate reason you have to go in there. But they think you're so dangerous that they want to escort you. And and the ACLU sued. They believe this is a violation of the, that consent decree. Um, you know, the big question is how are they? How do they even know who this certain person is? How do they know he's an activist? and their like, home addresses and whatnot, other kinds of personal information. It, it seems like they're doing it again, so they're litigating that now. Um, but the police department, meantime, is, is trying to argue that we don't need this old consent decree anymore. But it, it's, that was for old times, and we progressed past that, and you know, we, don't, we don't need it anymore. So it's going to be interesting to see where, where, it, where it lands up. But, you know, the Memphis police aren't supposed to be doing that sort of thing, but you know, there's a lot of indications that they are doing it now. The last time I was in Memphis, interestingly enough, they had a black police chief. 
Um, I don't remember his name, to be honest with you. But as I wandered through that brochure they had, I saw a guy who literally was one of the biggest racists in the history of police departments in this country. I saw him beat black guys. I, I, if I am not mistaken, he was in on that shooting of, of a kid who was trapped in the basement of a public housing unit and um, was shot and killed. But he was the assistant police chief of the police department in Memphis. And I said to myself, you got a black chief, but that guy there apparently is having a, a, a big thing to do with running this department. I don't know whether he's still there or now, but he sure was a, a, a big racist when I was there. Of course, that was some time ago. So if folks want to come up and ask questions, we have mics on either side, and you can just come on up. Or if anybody has any mobility difficulty, we can bring a mic to you also. Hi, good evening. Um, as I was listening to you guys talk about Mr. Withers, um, in my head, I was thinking about another story of infiltration of someone working as a spy, and that was the spook who sat by the door. Um, the, the, it's, as a photographer who, um, I live in West End, and I document gentrification and everything going on there, um, it blows my mind that someone who has direct access to, or who had direct access to the man, to the enemy, that he wouldn't have taken the information he was receiving or what he maybe knew within the FBI and he wouldn't have given it to the movement. Um, it's not really a question that I have. It's really just a comment that could, because as I'm sitting here listening to you guys, um, I'm just blown away. And, and the fact that you, know, you would say that maybe he wanted to take care of his family, his family are the very people that the movement was fighting for, his sons or his daughters. As they're growing, they're still gonna be disrespected and that is what the civil rights movement was for. Um, so um, do you know if he had, if he made any other comments about it or did he, um, I just really wanna dive into that aspect of it. Because I mean, he, there's so much information he could have brought back and he could have played double agent. Um, and, and I'm sure the movement would have taken care of him if they had known, oh wow, you have access um, to the very people who want to dismantle us. So I guess that would be my question. Do you know if there's... There, there, there is a lot of speculation about that. You know, was he, was he playing double agent? Of course, you know, the written reports that the FBI did they're not going to say anything about that. They're not going to say that he withhold, withheld information at certain times. But, um, you know, certainly a lot of people believe that he might have. And, um, you know, some of the things that he was doing for the FBI actually did help, um, you know, warn them off certain individuals who, I mean, they didn't have any business investigating a lot of people that they did. But, like, just to give you an example, um, you know, he helped the FBI figure out, I mean, there was the, the all-white FBI had really no clue about what was going on in the black community. So when a lot of these, um, you know, in the times of the late, you know, 68, 69, a lot of young men started wearing dashikis and wearing, you know, big Afro hairstyles. And, you know, the FBI's all freaked out about that sort of thing. But, you know, Ernest did tell them, you know, look, this is just a fad. I mean, these guys aren't revolutionaries. So, I mean, there were times when he warned them off certain individuals, got them to, you know, say, to reason with them now, to what degree that sort of thing went on? I mean, it's really hard to say, mm. um, you know, because there are no records that say that you know he he just withheld information about right. somebody that they were interested in. Okay, thank you. Hey, uh, good night. Um, as you two have said. Uh, oh, thank you. Hello, my name is Che. Thank you very much for being here tonight. Um, I'm an organizer here in Atlanta. And I think I have two questions. Um, one is about the, uh, the FBI agent 
um, who was your source. I can speculate a lot of reasons why a retired agent would turn over someone who's an informant, but I'm curious about your perspective as to why, what the motive was there. And then my second question is really just from an organizer's perspective, um, I'm really curious to know sort of what security measures do you wish you had had at that time? Um, and of course, you know, also as an organizer, I've experienced infiltration in our organization here in BLM and in other organizations, and I think that um, there's only so much we can do, right, as human beings, so I want to acknowledge that, but I'm curious what protocols you had in place to, um, to weed out new members, and then, you know, just hindsight, what do you wish you had had, and then, Mary, I think this question is really for you. Um, moving forward, I'm curious about what you see as some of the lessons learned um, from these stories of infiltration as it, as it relates to creating security protocols moving forward. Also recognizing that we want people in our movements, right? We want to build base, we want to be an open and welcoming environment, and also we want to be security minded. So how do you hold that balance? Well, I remember up in North Carolina, you probably heard of um, the shooting incident up there. Um, the Nazis, the, the Triple K, um, I, I can't think of the town it was in now, but y yeah, yeah. And um, we went up there to hold an informal hearing on, when I say we, I mean my North Carolina Advisory Committee. We went up there to hold a, uh, an informal hearing on race relations, right in the aftermath of those shootings. And um, interestingly enough, I was contacted by my front office in Washington, and they said to me, uh, why are you inviting the, um, the Triple K membership and the Nazis to to participate in this meeting. I said, well, if we're talking about race relations, they're the biggest races up, up there, and we need to hear from them. After that, I got a call from, I don't recall the name of the Jewish organization, but they called me and said, we are opposed to your inviting these folks to this meeting you all are having up here. So I told them, I said, well, you know, if you're going to find out the true relations that exist between blacks and, and whites in that area, it appears to me that you've got to have the other side. I know what they're going to say. They're going to say what they always say, but that needs to be heard in that area. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't back out. But, but after that meeting, the commissioners issued and it issued a regulation where we wouldn't invite Klansmen and Nazis to participate in, in any more meetings we had. I thought that was very, very narrow-minded, but that's what they did. And it, it bothered the devil out of me, to be honest with you, because I don't know how you can gauge the extent of race relations if you're just listening to yourself. And that's what they wanted us to do. Oh yeah, by the way, at that same meeting, interestingly enough, since all these folk were calling and raising questions about why I was inviting all these bad people up there, um, I thought it made sense to have some security. And so we invited um, a couple of U.S. Marshals to provide security at the, at the meeting we were having. And interestingly enough, uh, when they got to the meeting site, I was busy explaining to them where I wanted them to position themselves in the room. And they said to me, Mr. Doctor, we have been sent down here to provide you personal protection. So everywhere I went, they went. Everywhere I went, they went.
Well, I'll um, follow up there with your question. You know, I think uh, some of the lessons have, oh, Jesus, Lord, we're still learning them. But I think a lot of um, the lessons that uh, we learned from that incident and what we're seeing, um, I think one is that um, uh, we cannot be liberal in this time. And one of my other mentors, Kyla Mumbabaro, is always like, liberalism is killing the movement, you know? And, uh, what it, and how do we uh, exercise you know, hospitality to those folks who are coming into movement, eager and want to put their hands on the plow and also have to be like, actually, you need to take a few, you know, this is meeting, it's not for everybody. And how do we do that in a way that doesn't, you know, make so feel like we're silencing them or erasing their voice, but we have to be honest that uh, political trust is earned and it isn't just earned because you showed up, you know, and it's in the doing of the work together. It's sitting down, having a meal, you know, building uh, relationships with people. Um, and I think that because of the, especially over the last few years as, you know, protest movement um, and folks trying to being, you know, are being absorbed into organizations, there's way more in the streets than there are in organizations, you know, and to absorb folk into organization, making sure they have a thorough um, orientation process, understand how protocols work and setting up infrastructure, right? We had, you know, we were just like, yo, BLM, we're going to call a meeting, we're going to do it with no infrastructure um, that actually set the rules and the way we were going to, you know, be um, how we would communicate and things of that nature. And so I think had we, um, you know, would being, were a little bit more diligent on the front end around setting up infrastructure, that probably would have positioned us better to um, create a process that um, allow folks to come into the work, not isolate people, but also let people know that you don't just, you know, you don't just become a part of the organization because you showed up the first day, you know. Um, even uh, at some point I was like, look, we're going to stop selling t-shirts. Stop selling the damn t-shirts. Our movement is not for sale. You don't just get to wear a t-shirt and now you're an activist and now you know. That's earned. Earn that. Put some work in. Who are your people? You know, and that's one of the things that coming out of Song's legacy of work, you know, that is one of the, one of the first questions we ask. Who are your people? Who trained you up? How are you long? You know, and be more inquisitive about folk beyond what we learned um, you know, beyond what we just know online. I think um, um, uh, there are some other, um, some other movement elders who's given us some really wise advice and that if um, we're able to gird, um, you know, get the rigor to continue to build the chapter, there are some things that, you know, that was, there was really wise that they shared that, you know, call somebody house, tell them that, you know, they, you know, there were some tips, I don't know if I should say it, Oh, you got your, I don't know if I should say the tips, but they're good ones um, that can be useful. And, um, you know, just, you know, finding ways to vet people. And, of course, we ain't trying to be like the state. And also, if we, you know, I think we just have to take more serious about, take more serious um, the work that we're trying to move. We have to take it more serious and realize what's at stake. And I think many of us do. We're like, we have yet to see. We've seen some of uh, political prisoners in this time, from this iteration, the little homie from, um, from Ferguson, who got seven years for setting a car on fire. Um, um, and I know that there's been others. Uh, Jasmine, who was being tried, um, she was getting charges for lynching, right? And so we know that the stakes are high. And I think there's also, as Mama Ruby always says, like, um, you know, a lot of these folks come in and they're on the freedom high. You know, they're excited. They jazzed up, want to do all the things, and also what is, um, you know, how do we um, prepare our folks to go the journey? Um, and if we're in a protracted struggle, for real, for real, again, we'll take more seriously um, uh, the work that we're doing and what's at stake, build more solid infrastructure, and um, not be liberal and, and give folk time to wash dishes and lick stamps and just see if you show up, you know, and build relationships deeper. I'm sorry, you asked, the first question, I did not hear the, end, the, the last part of your question. Uh, yeah, it was just really, what are your, what's your speculation around why the FBI agent uh, gave up the informant? Well, I don't, that's a good question. Um, I don't think, he told me about him in the whole context of 
they were not doing electronic surveillance of Dr. King. They had lots of informants. Why did he drop Ernest Withers' name? I don't know to this day. Um, he, <laughs> he, I know he liked Ernest, and he thought he was a really good informant, said he was a really nice guy. There, he, he quite possibly had some motive to do that. I know that you know back in the day, back in the 60s, they used to use a lot of news people to get certain information into the papers, so I don't know if it was just habit from him. I mean, he was retired at that point, but I, you know, I really don't know, you know if he was just trying to play me and see how far this was going to go, but he definitely was not going to stand up and back it publicly. You know? So um, you know, I, I guess he just thought that's as far as it would go, you know, just letting me know. So. My guess is they had used him. They had used him up. Ernie had a good reputation in Memphis. He was one of the most personable individuals in the world. I enjoyed interacting with him. But I was really, really disappointed when I read some of the stuff that he said about me. Because none of it was true. Now, I did go over there, and I did help to organize the invaders. But um, I didn't do anything illegal. I was very careful about that. And I had done what my boss in Washington had asked me to do. And it was, I mean, the times were tough during those days. You had to be tough. And I tried to be. And a lot of people didn't like that. Okay. Um, as um, you two have said that um, Mr. Ernest was an esteemed, um, I guess, icon in the community. So I wanted to know, um, how did the city of Memphis um, react to your initial reporting when all this came out? There, there was a whole wide spectrum of reaction. Um, you know, his family and people in, you know, close supporters in that initially didn't believe it. Um, you know, some people said, I made it up. Over time, that's morphed into kind of innocent explanations, like um, it's been said in recent years that, um, you know, he just sold pictures to the FBI like he sold to numbers of other clients. He did do that, but he did a lot of other things for the FBI. But I mean, so there's been a lot of, you know, denial and a lot of coming to grips with it. This has been, that's been very difficult. Now, some people have, you know, said outright, you know, they thought he betrayed the movement. Um, I try not to, to judge him. Uh, you know, Dick Gregory, when he was alive, he, he very much thought that, you know, that Ernie had betrayed the movement. Um, Judge DeArmey Bailey, a big civil rights figure from Memphis, thought so too. But I mean, I think it's, it really is subjective. It depends upon your you know, point of orientation and, and your view. But there were, there's a whole wide spectrum. Um, of course, you know, this stuff is still coming out too. So um, I think he definitely betrayed individual confidences of individuals you know, and, and, and friendships and whatnot. People have said that, and so, I mean, th there you get into a whole other layer of what ethics and whatnot, but, um, um, yeah, so, I mean, there, there's just been a whole wide diversity of opinion on that. Okay, thank you. He also told lies. <laughs> he also told lies. Uh, Mark, uh, my name is Larry Sproul. Um, I want to bring it back, the conversation back to photography a little bit. Um, I'm finishing a manuscript called Weapons of Our Warfare and King's use of cameras as, as nonviolent weapons. There were a lot of photographers who he nurtured. Uh, he never goes on public record, you know, saying what he was doing in terms of his strategy, of what I've called the gospel of publicity. Of course, he was the chief apostle, you know. He lived for publicity for his movement and for their funding. And uh, I've always was curious about the segregationists and the reactionaries' use of photography. Um, Ernest, from Emmett Till's body all the way to Memphis to the funeral, he was there. He's the only photographer who was there through the whole 13 years of that experience. He was right there. And so this whole idea of famous, he did good work, 
it's very suspect because there were a lot of photographers that do, who did great work, great work. And uh, there's one picture, I want, if you have any comments about, it's the picture, because I, I saw the picture in your book about uh, the march against fear. Uh, I've looked at Bob, you know Bob Fitch? Uh, the, uh, he's a good friend, he's a late, uh, for, he was there, and he took a whole series of pictures of that march. And Bob's thing was always, he said, Larry, man, the whole thing, every shot I took was to be a bullet into the heart of evil. He had a specific purpose for the pictures he was taking. I'm not so sure now what Ernest's purposes were for taking his pictures. I'd like you to take a, give me a little comment on that in a minute, but there's also a, a picture from 1957 uh, uh, at uh, the Highlander folks uh, picture when they have King at the, at, that's the kind of real stupid stuff that segregationist photographers did. You know, it, it, was, it was corny, but it haunted King, you know. And by the time he gets to 65, 66, and the FBI 